And uh, we're glad you're with us this morning. I'm Pastor Matt. I'm the associate pastor here at the Island Church. And uh, it's my honor to bring the word today. Pastor Fred and Liz are in Southern California in Encinitas, North County, San Diego, with our good friends, Pastor Troy and Jessica Martin, uh, ministering at Venture Church. Venture Church is a church we've supported, helped plant and launch out there. And uh, Liz spoke to the women at the church at their women's event, I think, Friday night. And uh, Pastor Fred said she act- she absolutely knocked it out of the park. So that's awesome. We'd expect nothing less, right? And then Pastor Fred got to speak to the men uh, at their men's breakfast. And then uh, Pastor Fred will be preaching today uh, at Venture Church. So pray for them. Uh, we're also excited. Uh, we, uh, we lost Pastor Fred to Southern California for a weekend. But we got Pastor Philip and the missions team back. A lot of them were in the first service. If you were on the missions trip, can you just raise your hand so we can celebrate you? Uh, they're all wore out and they're all tired. And so uh, they're going to be in the 11 o'clock service. Okay. Uh, But uh, you saw in the video, just the awesome uh, ministry they did uh, building, doing construction, but you saw there's hands-on gospel ministry, preaching, teaching, encouraging the ministers and local church there. And uh, we think that's awesome. So welcome back, Pastor Philip. I got to say, uh, there were a couple days last week where I was uh, here in the church office without Pastor Fred and without Pastor Philip, and uh, my blood pressure was dangerously high, okay? And so pray, uh, uh, just, you know, actually don't pray, just be thankful that the Island Church is still standing, okay? All right, we made it, here we are. So glad to see Pastor Philip. Matter of fact, I saw uh, uh, Jenny Anthony, Pastor Philip's wife, post something on, on Instagram, and I was so excited to see, it looked like they were on the end of their trip, and they were getting ready to come home, maybe eating dinner or something. And I saw Pastor Philip's face in the video, and I just put, there he is. I was just so excited for him to return. But anyway, uh, also at the outset, we're, we're, just, we're, we're celebrating what God did on that trip. And, uh, and uh, we're also this morning, you may have heard in the news last night or this morning, uh, with everything going on between Israel and Iran. Listen, as a, as a church, as Christians, uh, Psalm 122.6 calls us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to pray for uh, wisdom for leaders, to pray for uh, peace, to pray for an ending of conflict. Listen, uh, we know that the blood of the innocent uh, cries out to God, as God's word tells us in Genesis, when Cain killed Abel, the scripture there says the, the blood cried out. And so we know uh, God hears uh, the cries of the innocent. But we also know in Ezekiel, God says he doesn't delight light in the death of the wicked. Uh, and with all this going on as Christians, sometimes it's easy to worry or be concerned, but, but Jesus predicted all of this. In Matthew 24, he said, there will be wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not alarmed. These are all birth pains and growing pains for what's to come. Cause as Christians, we believe that Jesus is coming back. Amen. Acts tells us much the way he left is the way he's returning, and we know Jesus is coming back. There's not one ounce of worry that's going to change the outcome, but there is a little bit of prayer the size of the mustard seed that can move mountains, amen? So as Christians, we pray for the conflict, we pray for the Middle East, but we don't buckle, we don't, we don't get worried, we don't get our hearts heavy, because all things are under his feet, amen? The kid's song is powerful. He's got the whole world in his hands, and he is ordaining the future. But at the outset, let's pray as a church for what's happening, for what's going on. But let's pray out of faith, knowing that God is in control. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray for peace in Israel, in the Middle East. We pray that there would be wisdom, that there would be a turning away uh, from violence and a turning to you, Lord God. We pray that uh, you would work in the situation over there, Lord God, and do what needs to be done. Lord, we, we over uh, from, from the United States, where we find ourselves this morning, Lord, we're praying from a posture, trusting that you are in control, knowing that you are coming back, 
In this world, there will be trials, there will be wars and rumors of wars, but Lord, you have the whole world in your hands. And so, Lord, this morning as a church, we lift up the situation, the conflict, the the trial, the devastation, and Lord, we are trusting you to have uh, the outcome and the victory regardless of what it looks like. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. Now, we're continuing this series this morning called Redcon 1. Redcon 1 is about the, the ready condition, the most ready condition, because level 5 would be the least and 1 would be the most, the most ready condition we need to be in for the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. And in this world, we will have trials. There is a battle. And Paul in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, which has been our key text for this whole sermon series, is telling us a little bit that the enemy has an arsenal. Uh, there's the world, the flesh, and the devil, and the enemy's trying to stir stuff up. The enemy's trying to attack and do harm. But he's telling us what the, the, the weapons of the world are, but he's also telling us what arsenal we have as Christians, as believers. He says we have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of readiness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and also praying at all times in the spirit. In the text, it tells us as Christians how we can be strong. Ephesians 6, 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then he's going to go on to use the illustration of these different components for the Christian, these different pieces of equipment and armor. And he tells us how to be strong and, 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 and how are we going to be strong in the Lord? And the answer is this, by putting on the full armor of God. And in the series, we've been breaking those things down. Uh, Pastor Fred opened with an overview, and we've been going through these and looking at the different layers of the different pieces of armor we as the believers can be retrofitted with in order to have the victory. And so today, we're going to focus on the feet, okay? If you think feet are gross, it's going to be a long morning for you. If you love feet, you're a weirdo, okay? Ephesians 6.15 says this, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. What is the shoes for our feet? What are we wearing for shoes for our feet? The readiness. The shoes of readiness. How do we get these shoes? How do we put on these shoes? By receiving the gospel of peace. What is the gospel of peace? The gospel of peace explicitly stated is this. Because of Jesus, you and I, enemies of God, have been reconciled to the Father. You and I were enemies of God, but he brokered a peace treaty through his son for all who declare Christ is Lord. So if you are a believer in Christ, you are no longer an enemy of God. You have been reconciled. You have been returned to the Father in relationship. If your faith is in the atoning, sin-forgiving work of Jesus Christ, you have been returned and reconciled to God the Father. And now God doesn't see you as the sinner you are. He sees you wrapped in his son's righteousness, pure, forgiven. You're no longer an enemy. You are a friend of God now. That's the gospel. You were an enemy. Now you're a son. Now you are a daughter because of the peace paid for by Jesus Christ. Amen? That's as simply as I can state the gospel of peace. And if you've said yes to Jesus, your faith is rooted, he is Christ, he is Lord, there is no more ready condition than you can find yourself in than having said yes to Jesus. Amen? If you said yes to Jesus, you're ready to live, you're ready to die. You're ready to defend, you're ready to offend. And we're going to look at some of those components here this morning. Romans 5.10 says this, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, 
Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? If your faith is in Jesus, you are saved. Sometimes as Christians, it's easy to go, well, when I first gave my life to Christ, you know, I was saved. But, you know, after being a Christian for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, man, I don't know if I was saved. Listen, you're never more saved than when you're saved, okay? You were just a bad Christian, okay? And then you got better at it, hopefully, amen? And guess what? The good news this morning is anything worth doing is worth doing badly, okay? So if you were in Christ, reconciled to God, you are saved. And that's what the scripture is saying. We were reconciled because of his death. He paid the price. Now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. You can have security in Christ. You can be ready for anything in Christ because of the shoes of readiness that come from believing in the gospel of peace. So this morning, if you already believe the gospel, you're ready. If you already believe the gospel, you're both ready and on the route to readiness. There's some things in the Bible that are already and not yet. If you've read the Bible very long, you'll pick up on this tension. The kingdom of God is here, but it's yet to come in fullness. It's already and it's not yet. Are you with me? Jesus talks about the victory, the victory he has. Paul says that that God now is crushing the enemy under his feet, but yet still the church went through trial and tribulation and persecution. And if you've read church history, what happened under Nero, you wouldn't believe it. Christians hanging from crosses, burning to light his garden parties. Already, not yet. If you believe the gospel, you're already ready, but you're also on the route to readiness. So the title this morning is, Are You Ready? Four Stops on the Route to Readiness. And I love this title because it speaks to the situation of shoes. In the ancient world, shoes were kind of a big deal, particularly for soldiers. We see that in in the uh, historical text, Josephus, he wrote it, The Jewish War, in volume 6, 1a, that the Roman soldiers wrote and I, uh, wore, and I quote, shoes thickly studded with sharp nails. And these shoes that were studded were to give them a good grip on the ground. And these contribute to the success of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar because their armies, having this excellent footwear, they were able to undertake long marches at incredible speed over rough terrain. Furthermore, the soldier with these shoes was able to get their feet right, position their shield, or strike their sword with firm foundation and firm footing. I'm assistant coaching T-ball for six-year-olds right now. Yeah, you should laugh and pray, all right? I don't know if you've ever been hit by a six-year-old with an aluminum baseball bat, but it's not awesome. I don't know if you've ever uh, played catch with some kids who are still learning how to play that game, and you turn your back to go get a ball, they wildly threw, and then as you turn your back to go get the ball, a couple of balls just right by your head. They were throwing balls at me when I wasn't looking, all right? That's against the rules of catch, okay? But what we have to tell our kids constantly when they go up to the tee is get your feet right. All practice long. The statement you will hear for an hour said over and over again, doesn't matter which team, which coach, it's get your feet right, get your feet right, get your feet right, get your feet right. Oh, by the way, get your feet right. And then there's 20 parents shouting over the coaches, get your feet right. It's really fun. You should sign up. So the kids that come up to the plate, all right, Sammy, get your feet right. And I got to say, everything rises and falls on leadership, so this is on me. But some of our kids have been playing for three years, and it's like they've never hit off a tee before. And so we got to say, get your feet right. And I get that it's on me. They get your feet right. They get their feet right. They get their bat right. Eye on the ball. And they go, and hopefully don't hit one of the coaches helping them. But if they don't get their feet right, they can't hit the ball. Are you with me? In the same way for the soldier, if the soldier didn't get their feet right, it's hard to lift a shield or swing a sword. So the shoes, you don't think about necessarily being defensive, but they're absolutely critical for defense or offense in the ancient world. 
They're critical. And we as Christians, we have to get our feet right. We got to put on the readiness, the shoes of readiness that come from the gospel of peace. So our first stop is this. We need to be ready to defend. Ready to defend. Battles require offense and defense. If we're in a battle, there's going to be an offensive front. There's going to be a defensive front. This was particularly true in the ancient world. You didn't have F-16s or Huey helicopters or drones. You didn't have any of that. You didn't have missiles flying overhead. If one of these nations wanted to wage war on another nation, they got their troops together, they got their armor on, they got their shoes on, and they marched over great distances and rough terrain. And when they got to a, a, a general proximity of where they wanted to strike, guess what they had to do? I don't know if you know this, but soldiers need to eat food. Soldiers need rest. They'd have to build a camp. They'd have to build a defensible position from which to strike their enemies. And so once they would have that defensible position, they would then begin to prepare the offensive front. That's how battle was waged in the ancient world. That was true kind of in a, a macro sense for the whole army, but it's also true in a micro sense for the, a micro sense for the individual soldier. The individual soldier is going to go on the line, get on the line, get ready to charge out there. And if you don't have footwear, the proper studded shoes of readiness, it's going to be hard to march out there. Listen, right now, I turned 40 this year. I can't walk across my grass without saying, ouch, once barefoot, okay? Anybody else with me, all right? No Scott's turf builder can help me, all right? I step on one blade of grass the wrong way, and it's a problem. So it's flip-flops and house shoes in the yard for me, okay? Imagine in the ancient world. Hey, I'm here to fight. No shoes of readiness. Running out to a place where there's mud and blood and conflict and people are dying. Is that the kind of environment you want to run out to with no shoes on? I'm like, man, give me my Timberland boots. So I'll go out there in those, in those shoes. But in the ancient world, if you ran out there with your feet exposed, you were vulnerable. You can't lift a shield. You can't strike with a sword unless you have the shoes of readiness. And in this metaphor, Paul's telling us it's the same thing. Why did the shoes come before the shield and the sword? Because we have to get our feet right in order to lift the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Are you with me? And so how do we do this? There's a sense in this passage where we're, our shoes are, are a defensive tool. They're not only a defensive tool, but they're definitely a defensive tool. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and, and respect. Now, with these battle metaphors it's really easy to get carried away. But our battle metaphor is, is just an illustration, right? We're not actually walking out there with shields and swords and bopping anyone in the head, okay? Or poking anyone in the stomach, okay? If you are, you're doing it wrong, okay? But there is a battle. And in this battle, we have to be prepared to make a defense. A defense for what? Peter tells us, for the hope that is in you. Be prepared be ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared to make a defense. Well, how do we do that? Let your life glorify God. Let the specific components of who you are give you a firm defensible position against the accusations and attacks of the enemy. Well, how do we do that? With your words, make a defense. With your actions, make a defense. With your marriage, make a defense. With your parenting, make a defense. With your work, make a defense. Many of us won't get up in a pulpit and preach, but your life is a pulpit, so preach something good. 
If you're parenting, you're a Christian, and your parenting is, is neglectful, that's not God's best for your life. That gives the world accusation to say, look at this guy, he's a Christian, and he's a horrible father, he's a hor- she's a horrible mother. Listen, that doesn't make a defense. If you're here on Sunday, and you're talking with pure words and kind words, but out in the world, man, you're known for just cussing up a storm and burning down the house with your tongue, that doesn't make a defense for the gospel. Are you with me? If your marriage is struggling and it's bleeding over and the world sees that and you're saying, yes, Jesus, I love, I love Jesus, come to church, and, and, and the marriage is, is fractured and, and, and strengthen your marriage. You say, you say the grass is greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it, friend. Make a defense with your marriage. Now, there's seasons, there's trials, there's forgiveness for all that. But as Christians, we have to take the charge of gospel readiness seriously. Amen? Make a defense with your work, your words, your actions, your parenting. Make a defense. We all need to know why we believe what we believe. And that's part of the understanding what you believe. There's an understanding, there's an internal uh, uh, mental process of I know in my head and my heart why I believe what I believe, but there's also the outward actions that my belief is in God is visible by the way I live my life. We got to do the living and we have to be the true being that loves Jesus. How do we do this? How do we do this? How can I with my words, make a defense. With my actions, make a defense. With, 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 with my marriage, make a defense. With my parenting, read your Bible. Know your word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Your faith will actually grow when you read the Bible. You said, I read it, I didn't understand it. That's a part of the process. It's called wrestling with the text. There is a mystical and I'll cautiously say magical nature about the word of God. That when we go to it, when we read it, when we hear it, when we take it in, our faith in God the Father grows. I lead a men's Bible study Tuesday mornings at 6.30 in the morning. Pray for me. I made that choice. And there's about 20 of us guys in there. And we read through the Bible. And if you've been in that group, you know one of the preambles is we're, we're just reading the Bible together out loud and then discussing what we read and asking questions and iron sharpening iron. And it's a multi-denominational group, so sometimes it gets a little interesting. And, and one of the things I say is, uh, we're going to make observations and applications and ask questions along the way, but we're probably not going to be able to answer everything. Part of the journey of, of knowing God and trusting God and, and, and knowing him as he's revealed himself in his word is wrestling with his word. That means sometimes you won't get it because we see, as the Bible says, through a glass dimly. But the solution isn't to not Go on the journey of discovery in the word of God. The solution is to read your word, know your word, and grow in your understanding over the course of your lifetime as a Christ follower. That's the goal. We all need to know why we believe the hope in Jesus. We all need to know uh, what we believe about right and wrong and how we can draw a line between right and wrong and the scriptures. We have to know that. We have to know that. Read your Bible. How do we do that? Get in a Bible study. Get in a Bible study that's reading the Bible. There's a, one of our counselors here, counselors here, Dr. Wayne Corey and I were having this conversation like six months ago, seven months ago. And I said, Dr. Q, I'm just frustrated. I feel like the church, capital C, the church, the whole church and all the world has all these Bible studies where people are reading books about the Bible. There's nothing wrong about reading books of the Bible, but I feel like very few of them are actually reading the Bible. And when you read a book about the Bible, maybe 5% of it, 10% of it is scripture, and it's a lot of a person's thoughts about stuff that's going on and how to apply this to your life. It may be right. It may be wrong. Our Christian bookstores are full of heresy. What do I mean by heresy? Stuff that's just wrong. But somebody got a publishing contract, and some Christian book company thought they could make a few bucks off it, and there it is in your bookstore. That's the world we live in. 
It's almost like in this, this, this armor metaphor, in the full armor of God, we need like the, the, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, and the crossbow of discernment. You know what I mean? Because there's a ton of just nonsense out there, and the internet's just made it worse. There has never been a time for you to get more rooted in scripture than today. Get your life grounded in the word of God. And what a time to be alive. Man, you have the Bible. Like, there's a lot of dumb things we can do with our smartphones. But one of the smartest things you could do is read your Bible with a Bible app. And the Bible app will actually read it to you out loud as you're driving down the road. And correct me if I'm wrong, you can put an English accent on that thing, all right? You're like, this part of the Bible seemed a little uninteresting before, but with that accent, it sounds very nice, you know? There's no excuse to not be just immersed in the word of God as much as you can get it in your life. Know what you believe and why you believe it. And in this battle metaphor, again, it's easy. It's easy to get aggressive, all right? I'm a six foot six red meat eating man. It's easy to get aggressive, okay? But we have to know what we believe with gentleness and respect. With gentleness and respect. Respect. The second stop on this route to readiness is that we are ready to charge. Ready to charge. In the ancient world, your, 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 your troops, your army would march out, set up camp, defensible position. When the battle comes, you go get on the front line. You get on the front line, and what are you doing on the front line? You've got your shield, you've got your armor, you've got your sword. You're ready to now charge the target and attack. That's where this is going, right? So if Paul is telling us, put on the full armor of God, you got to be ready to defend, but you got to be prepared to charge out there. And the shoes of readiness, there's a sense in which Paul is saying, we need to have these shoes of readiness that come from the gospel, that are given by the gospel of peace, so that we can charge out on the field and share Jesus. I love war movies. War movies, battle movies, are awesome, okay? All the moms judging me right now, don't, okay? Anybody else love war movies? Dad, it's okay. You're in a safe place. How dare you? I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I love battle movies. My favorite part of any war movie is the charge. When the army is lined up and they're ready to run into battle, and attack. That is my favorite part. It's so much so my favorite part that I Googled like two weeks ago, best charge scenes in a war movie of all time. And what a time to be alive. That video exists. And then it said top 10, but then Lord of the Rings gave us like three or four, so they put them all in one. And I'm just watching Braveheart, The Patriot, Last Samurai, Gettysburg, Band of Brothers, just charge scene after charge scene. And I, like, if you were in the hallway in the office that day, it, it so emotionally moved me that I'm, like, weeping at my desk. I'm like, <laughs> like, you could hear in the hallway. I was like, someone's about to come in and check on me. And like, oh, is he just reading his Bible and spiritually moved? No, I was watching Braveheart clips online. Don't judge me for how I use my office time, Okay. But I love those scenes when they charge out and take the field. Man, Braveheart, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. If you're a man and you don't know that, I'm, I'm questioning your masculinity right now. Man. It always comes back to Mel Gibson, but the Patriot, the Patriot. Anybody seen the Patriot? Remember the whole, the whole problem with the Continental Army? And the militias, the line keeps breaking, the line keeps breaking, and the, they run away, and the British just chase them into the forest, and that's the whole problem why they keep losing. And then Mel Gibson's character, Benjamin Gates, the line's breaking at the final battle in the movie, and he picks up the American flag, just runs up to the hilltop, starts waving it back and forth, whoo, whoo, shouting, hold the line, hold the line. An eagle flies over, an F-16 goes over the battle, a football team on the side starts going, USA, USA, no, okay, some of those things didn't happen, I don't want to spoil the movie for you, 
But it's just this awesome, just, you know, like to me, the reason why it chokes me up a little bit is there's no greater love than when one man lays his life down for another. And I know these are fictional movies and, you know, uh, the bad guy in The Patriot, he's probably still alive. He didn't actually die in that battle, that fictional battle. But there's just this power of the army unifying and charging on the field. Man, in Braveheart, there's, there's the main battle. We all know you may, you may, take, our, uh, you may take our lives, but you may never take our freedom. But there's the one where the, 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 the red-headed character, William Wallace's best friend, his name is Hamish, by the way, you're welcome. He throws out William Wallace's sword and it just flies through the air, <laughs> stabs in the ground. And then the whole army starts going, Wallace, Wallace, Wallace. And then Robert the Bruce, who was a coward earlier, he puts on his helmet, charges out there, and they go out to fight England. And it's just, whew, it fires me up. You know, it's awesome. But there's a sense in this passage where Paul is telling Christians, the church, get your shoes of readiness on. We need to charge out there and win the world. Amen. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. God saying to us this morning that if we, with our words and with our life, if we, if we preach the good news, that we have beautiful feet. Now, your feet in reality might be gross, and they probably are. But the word of God says that those who bring the gospel, those who charge into the field and share the gospel, how beautiful are the feet of those? A lot of times when we talk about witnessing, we talk about witnessing to strangers, and that's good. We, 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 we need to have an answer, as Peter said, to all who believe. But you know where we need to charge the battlefield the most? It's not over there somewhere. It's right in our own homes is where we need to charge in and share the gospel. Husbands, fathers, we're the priests, we're the pastors of our home. We need to share the gospel with our wives, with our kids, teaching them, instructing them in the gospel. Mothers, moms, wives, you are a disciple maker in your home. Nourish the gospel in your kids, in your grandkids, in your home. Listen, I, I've shared the gospel with strangers, and that's good. And I'm sure you have witnessed or, or prayed for somebody out there, and that's good. But it's a little harder to spiritually eat at home sometimes as people see our faults. Don't use that as an excuse to not charge the field of your home. Use that as a battle cry that even you who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God have been reconciled and redeemed and returned to the Father. It's not about being perfect, you guys. Charge the field. We need to be ready to do this for anyone who asks but particularly in our home. This was so important that Paul told Timothy, a young leader, that when he was looking for leaders to step up in his church and in his ministry, he said, look for people who are priests of their homes. Now, he gave more specific behavioral details, but the sum total of what Paul told Timothy about looking for leaders was looking for leaders who lead their home rightly. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says this, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? That's written to say there is a standard 
by which we promote leaders in the church, and we want leaders who pastor their homes well. Paul is saying when the church is most vulnerable in that first century, he's saying, Timothy, elevate people who charge their homes and lead the home well. You say, well, that's just a standard for elders. Listen, the standards in Scripture are standards we should all aspire to. Amen? One of the worst things we can do with our faith is go, oh, that standard's for somebody else, or that's for somebody else. If it's in Scripture, and Scripture tells us to preach the Word, you don't need a pulpit to preach the Word. Preach the Word with your words and your life. There's other religions in the world that really get this. The religion of Islam, Muslims firmly understand this. They realized September 11th, 1683, at the Battle of of Vienna, they couldn't conquer the Christian West. They lost, and that's the moment in history where the Christian West gained dominance over the Islamic world. The Holy Roman Empire and her allies, they won, and they gave their sure-footed dominance over Europe and in the Middle East. While there's certainly still a measure of violence in Islam, the vast majority of the Islamic world realizes that they can take the world by just reaching their homes. They can take the world by just raising up their children to worship Allah. Now I'll say this, Allah is a false god, Muhammad is a false prophet, and Islam is a false religion. We do not worship the same God. If you believe that, you haven't read your Bible. If you believe that, you haven't read their Bible either. But they understand the value in reaching their homes to the extent that in Austria today, where the Battle of Vienna took place, it's 8.3% Muslim today. In England, 6% with 15% in London. France, 15%. There is an Islamic rise to where one leader said that in a few decades, Islam will conquer Europe without firing a bullet because of the principle of reaching their homes. If we, as Christ followers, break kind of the evangelical legacy of big ministries, big churches, big personalities, and broken homes, and really lead into the priestly roles we're called to lead in our homes, and really win our homes. If we win our home, we will win generations. If you win kids, your kids, you will win your grandkids and their grandkids' kids, and their grandkids' kids, and those kids, and those kids, you will change the world by just pastoring your home. Win your home, change the world. Win your family, win generations. Amen? How do we do this? Read the Bible as a family. It doesn't have to be pretty. When I read the Bible with our kids, sometimes Olivia is like throwing breakfast across the table, and I'm like dodging cereal and milk, okay? It's not always pretty. Read the Bible as a family. Dad, take the lead. Mom, nurture your kids in Christ Jesus. Pray. Pray more often than what is considered normal. My father-in-law, Pastor Fred, does this well, and my wife does this well because my wife is really a disciple of her father, A few days ago, we were loading up the kids in the car, and I got to say, I, I'm good at some things, but loading up our kids in the car is one thing I really struggle with, okay? Being six foot six, trying to bend over into a car, it just, it's hard, okay? It's hard to get in there, okay? Tall people, you know what I'm talking about. Short people, you don't know how easy you got it. The world was made for you, Okay? I don't know if there was a ride at that OA theme park in Foley that I can actually get on legally. Loading up Livy, and she has her thumb right where the door closes. You know where this is going. Don't judge me, or do. I close the door, and the little tip of her little precious thumb is in between the seal and the door. I'm mad at myself, too. And she screams, and rightly so. And I'm like, oh, what's wrong? Oh, your finger is in the door. And it shouldn't be. Open door, and it's, you know, it's just swelling up. I can see it. 
You know, it's got a little heartbeat. Boom, 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 boom. We're getting bigger. And my wife runs out, takes the baby from me because I lost my credibility as a father. And just begins to pray over her little precious thumb. And I'm like, my wife gets it. There's no bad reason or bad time to pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray over this little situation. Pastor Fred called me the other night. Sammy wasn't feeling good earlier in the week. And without even asking, he's, we were just talking on speakerphone, and hears Sammy's raspy voice in the background, and he just launches into praying for little Sammy. How, how do you spiritually lead your home? Pray. Pray more than what is required. Pray in the spirit. Pray for all things. There's not a bad thing in your life to pray about. Are you with me? And when you do that, all of this that we talk about on Sunday morning, it goes home, and your kids see that, and your kids see that this is real. They see that Christ is really in you. Be ready to charge. Be ready to run into your home and lead your home. The third stop is this. Be ready to offend. Ready to offend. And we're going to close out here pretty quick. We're going to go fast. Real Christian love, even with gentleness and respect to you guys, it's offensive to a world that is perishing. Do you get that? Let me say that again for everyone. Believing in Jesus, believing that the Bible is true, is inherently offensive to the world. Even if you have a biblical worldview and you share it with somebody with gentleness and respect, the cross, the word of God, is offensive to the world that is perishing. So as Christians, in a battle, we'll get into this more with the sword of the spirit, but you have to be ready to offend we're ready to defend. We're ready to charge. Ah, what are you going to get out there on the battlefield and be like, oh, sorry, 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 excuse me, sorry, 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 excuse me. But that's really kind of what a lot of us are doing, isn't it? We're running out into a battle, and we're concerned about inflicting any damage because damage means somebody got their feelings hurt. And in our culture today, we all know this, hurt feelings is the worst thing in the world. No, it's not. Listen, there are moments in the New Testament where Jesus hurts feelings. Perfect Jesus, truth incarnate. He called names. He called Peter Satan. He called the Pharisees a brood of vipers and whitewashed tombs. Do you guys remember that story about the money changers? It's easy to miss this part. It says in the scriptures that he drove them out with a whip. Indiana Jones style. That's in your Bible. If I was chasing people around with a whip in here, we'd have some serious problems. You'd probably see that, right? What I'm trying to say to you is the word of God is offensive to people who are caught up in sin. It is going to offend even when it's gentle and respectful. I can respectfully say to you that there's a context for sexuality. And that context is marriage between a man and a woman. But what I just said right there is offensive to the world. Do you see that? You say, but Pastor Matt, isn't God love? And I say, yes, God is love. And because God is love, he sets the terms, and he defines what love is, and he has. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, and this is the part I really want us all to hear. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. This passage is not for marriage, it's for Christians. This passage is for all God's people, and it's where God in his word defines what love is. And love can't be love if it's delighting in evil. I'm a pastor, and if you get offended at this, it just proves my point. And I don't say that to have a chip on my shoulder. And I say this saying that God forgives a multitude of sins, sexual sins, 
any kind of sin. God forgives sins. That's what the cross is a picture of. It's him atoning for our sins. Amen? But as a Christian, I'm not loving somebody if I delight in evil. I don't support same-sex marriages. I won't go to a same-sex wedding because love does not delight in evil. If I had a friend that said, my marriage is bad, I got a girlfriend, I'm not divorced yet, but I got a girlfriend, will you come meet my girlfriend? No, I won't because I'm not going to celebrate that relationship in your life because it's sinful. Listen, the Bible is an equal opportunity offender. Whether it's same-sex attracted or a little too heterosexually attracted, sexual sin is sexual sin in Scripture. That's offensive to the world. I'll probably get an email or two for just saying that. But listen, either God's word is the standard or it's not. Amen? Listen, God's the definer of love. And love rejoices with the truth. It doesn't suppress the truth to remain liked. Many of us are afraid to inflict any damage in this battle because it may hurt someone's feelings. And I'm telling you, there's something worse than hurt feelings. And it's hell. When we repented because of what Jesus did on the cross, we were saved. We were saved from something. I think we were saved from a worse version of our life. I do believe that's true. But we were also saved from hell. We are in Christ. And we're ready. You can't live your life trying to stay out of hot water. You'll just be dirty. Hot water keeps you clean, hello? Niceness is not the fruit of the Spirit. Kindness is. And it's a truly remarkably unkind thing to be sitting on eternal life that is available for whomsoever would believe and being unwilling to share that because it might cause a little conflict in the relationship. That is selfishness incarnate. Jesus was truth incarnate. And the truth is what sets people free. Amen? I know that's a hard, uh, that's, that's a hard, tough word. But the church is either going to stand for something or fall for anything. And we're going to choose to stand here at the Island Church. The final step is this, ready to win, ready to win. We in Christ have the victory. Amen? Five of you believe that, okay? Sometimes I get frustrated as a Christian because I feel like we're reading two different Bibles. Uh, you're reading doom and gloom Bible where everything is bad and the world is going to hell in the handbasket and we're hoping to get on that rapture escape pod and get out of here before it gets really, really bad. And I'm reading the Bible where Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords, and he wins. It drives me bonkers. Every battle has an outcome. And for us in Christ, we were captives, but Jesus came to set the captives free. You remember that part? We are captives that have been set free. So being captured again is not an option. We win or we die. Hello? What do I mean by that? We're putting the full armor of God on, and we're charging into battle, ready to defend, ready to defend. And in that battle, there's going to be an outcome. We're going to see the victory, or, it's, or we're, going to, we're going to die at some point. But here's the good news. In Christ, whether you win, whether you die, you win. Do you remember the thief on the cross? Man, I don't know what he stole, but he must have stole something pretty amazing to get capital punishment for it. It must have been some Ocean's 11, Ocean's 12 stuff. But there he is on the cross next to Jesus, his life force slipping out, and he makes a declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. And what does Jesus look to him and say? Remember, he did nothing good. He didn't get baptized. He didn't go to growth track. He didn't go to church a single Sunday in his life. And Jesus looks at the thief on the cross who stole something so amazing that he got capital punishment and says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. You are saved by faith. In Christ, because we're saved by faith, whether we see the victory or we die, we win. Are you with me? And when I read the Bible, the language is victorious. 
Daniel 7, 14, he, Jesus, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. If you can never be destroyed, your kingdom can never be destroyed, you win. Revelation 7, 14, they will make war on the Lamb. There will be conflict. There will be battle. We're, we're talking about the armor of God. Every week we say there's going to be battle. There's going to be battle. We're in a battle. They will wage war on the Lamb, but the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called are called and chosen and faithful. Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the defensive gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're going to get in there and we're going to clang on the gates and we're going to knock them down. And I don't know if you've ever knocked down a gate. Someone might get their feelings hurt. But that's okay, because you have something good. The gospel is good news, and will knock down the gates. Psalm 47, 8, God reigns over the nations. God is seated in his holy throne. Hebrews 2, 8, my favorite one. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing, nothing, nothing that is not under him. Revelations 11:15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Jesus Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You have the victory. I have the victory. Let's start talking like it. I'm so glad you joined us today for Island Church Online. If you made a decision in your heart to follow Christ today, please let us know. You can text the word NEXT to 251-244-2030, where we'll send you some free digital resources and get you started in your journey of faith in Christ. This also gives us an opportunity to celebrate with you and pray for you. To give toward the ministry of this house, go to the islandchurch.tv slash give. Your gifts are what make this possible. We're so glad that you made the Island Church your home for Sunday worship today. And my prayer is that your year will be full of God's grace and blessings as you follow after him.